All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. This is Christopher, and I am so glad you could join me for another episode of Legends and Losers. Uh, Colin will actually be part of our dialogue with our guest, who today is none other than the legendary Brian Kramer. We continue in our effort to hack the best minds in Silicon Valley, and in Brian's case, the best minds in marketing. Um, and uh, I'll get more into who Brian is in a second. But um, given he's with us, I wanted to share some things to uh, shine a light on uh, some of the key and uh, fascinating things going on in the marketing world right now. Uh, first, according to Mark, uh, according to Gartner, marketing budgets have continued to increase as a percentage of companies' uh, revenue. Um, and so today, in 2006, they got to 12% of company revenue is now being spent on marketing. So companies are clearly trying to take their marketing game and marketing spend up. Interestingly, marketing leaders spent more on their websites, digital commerce, and digital advertising than other categories in 2006. So budgets are going up and spend on all things digital are now larger than other categories, according to uh, Gartner. Now, uh, this next set of facts you might find interesting uh, from Char Van Boskirk, uh, a vice president at Forrester Research, who says that U.S. digital marketing spend will near 120 billion by 2021. And uh, he defines that as investment in paid search, display advertising, social advertising, online video advertising, email marketing will be 46% of all advertising in four years. So um, by 2021, 120 billion in the US. And um, in that same time frame, digital spend will be 46, so clearly approaching 50% of uh, marketing spend. So clearly, we all need to get our uh, digital marketing uh, shit together. And um, another sort of interesting tidbit, um, millennials who are consumers between a, the age of 18 and 35, uh, my favorite generation, um, they're the largest living generation. And collectively, uh, this is uh, according to Shar again, collectively, they spend today $600 billion a year. And if you think about that, where do you think millennials go to look for and buy their shit? Uh, most of them look through some kind of a digital channel. So, oh, and here's a fun tidbit for you. Remember the Pokemon Go bullshit that was going on uh, towards the end of last year? Well, it felt like it went away, right? The company behind Pokemon Go, a company called Nitanic, says that the app has still more than 65 million monthly users. So I forget who said this joke, but I thought it was pretty fucking funny. Next time you feel like you're wasting your life, just remember that 65 million monthly users are still playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> but it, on a serious, on a more serious note, uh, clear evidence of how compelling and how sticky uh, AR or augmented reality is and uh, an indicator of uh, where things might go with virtual reality, which we get into with our guest. So let me tell you about Brian. He's a renowned social business strategist, uh, speaker, uh, executive coach, and best-selling author. Uh, like I said, he's the entrepreneur, entrepreneur founder uh, of an outfit in San Jose called Pure Matter, a uh, digital consulting group. Uh, he's one of the world's foremost leaders in the art and science of sharing and has been credited with inciting the uh, hashtag H2H or human to human business movement and marketing and social. Uh, he's got over 35,000 social fans and followers, and he possesses an intimate understanding of the intricacies and inner workings of both social technologies and social behaviors. His first book, There Is No B2B, or B2C, it's human to human, rose to number one selling spot on Amazon's business books in its first weeks. And uh, in January 2015, H2H was named the number one buzzword for 2015 by the writer. His latest book, uh, an absolute must read, Shareology, How Sharing is Powering the Human Economy, uh, was named a USA Today top 150 uh, book. Um, and the week of his, its uh, release, it was number one on Amazon in four categories. Uh, Brian speaks all around the world. 
Uh, he's been named a top 50 social CEO on Twitter by Huffington Post, a top 25 influencer to follow by Forbes, and uh, one of the most 100 influential tech people on Twitter by Business Insider. So with that, here he is, our friend Brian Kramer. All right, Brian Kramer, um, tell us something legendary. Uh, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> You, I mean, can you get more legendary than that? Has it, has it been a long week? Is that what's going on? <laughs> no, I just celebrate Friday because that means that I sleep in on a Saturday. I always sleep in on a Saturday unless I'm traveling. And that makes, that makes the entire week legendary. So what time do you think you'll get up tomorrow morning? <laughs> uh, well, tomorrow I'll get up at probably, probably around 9, 9.30, maybe 10. Um, after a week or two of travel though, I can tell you last Saturday, I got up at noon, um, after I, I gave, I think seven presentations and keynotes and all that within a week. And I was just so tired that by Saturday I was like, okay, if it's, I don't care if it's 4 PM, I'm not, I'm not waking up. So you're saying it's tiring being a legendary uh, no. social media marketing. No, I used to, <laughs> I've done this my whole life. I'm, I'm a sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And were you, were you traveling? Did you just get back home? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Were you anywhere particularly interesting? Uh, I don't count Vegas as that particularly interesting, so I'm not going to go with that one. <laughs> um, but the conference was really good. It was the Adobe Summit, um, and, uh, and it was a great audience. And then I flew straight from there to, uh, to San Diego, which I do enjoy. I think that San Diego is a nice place. So that was fun, and that was social media marketing world. And I was um, really honored to give a keynote panel on the main stage, and then two uh, separate presentations, a pa another separate panel on storytelling, and one on influencer marketing. And the, the keynote panel was actually really interesting. It was on artificial intelligence, uh, chatbots, and um, virtual reality, and what and how it's going to integrate with social media. Wow! So how how why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah, it was, um, well, it was, I had three people, three smart people on my panel. Um, they were uh, Chris Penn, Chris Carfee, Chris Penn's from Shift Communications. He's just this brainiac guy that can sit down and do anything that involves math and programming and marketing, um, which is rare. And then, um, and then uh, Chris Carfee is the head of uh, content and uh, now artificial intelligence for um, GoDaddy. And then uh, Sandy Carter, uh, who just left um, uh, IBM is, uh, is, is, has, not, has not mentioned where she's going to next, but it's going to be epic. And um, she's a really smart person. She's top 10 in chatbots and artificial intelligence on Forbes. So just a really good, smart panel. And we talked about uh, the differences between artificial intelligence, the, different, um, uh, diff the differences between machine learning and artificial intelligence. We talked about how chatbots are available to us right now that we can go on. And in fact, I spent this morning programming a, a chatbot, or not programming, I should say, um, working this program to, to put a chatbot together. Uh, so, so it's available now to almost any company to take advantage of it. And I, so I'm starting to see the benefits to that as a marketer. And so then, how, how do you see chatbot helping, helping marketers? Oh man, possibilities are endless. I mean, um, you know, you can't really replace a relationship. So that's what scares everybody about these chatbots. They'll never be as smart as, as us, or at least not for 50 years or 25 maybe. But, we, um, we, but we hope, and then, they, then they come out of our computers and turn into cyborgs and tear our heads off and take over the world. Is that, what, is that where chatbots, is that where it goes? <laughs> yeah, they won't be called chatbots at that point. <laughs> they yeah, will they, be called the Terminator. Yeah, they'll um, be called, we're going to fuck you up, bots. <laughs> right? <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to see some really cool things. Like, um, you know, the, there's, uh, if, you, if you're running a marketing campaign and you're trying to uh, build some engagement with your um, with, with your, your potential customers. I think it's a great way to get in, into their, their, where they already exist. We've always been saying that as marketers. So to get on to, you know, if your customer's on Instagram, go to Instagram. If your customer's on Facebook, go to Facebook. And if your customer's on like Messenger, um, which I am all the time, then, then, that's a, then it's a good idea to be in Messenger and start to use that as a marketing tool without, you know, annoying people. 
And chatbots are a great way to do that because you can, you can get in, you can ask, you can engage them and then you can get them to opt into your content through there. And then you can do all kinds of things. It's kind of endless. So for those of us who failed grade 10 math and didn't go to college, could you unpack, you know, for like a five-year-old, what is a chatbot? A chatbot is, is, um, is a, uh, uh, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a, a place that you can, it's a thing that you build that interacts with other humans. It allows you to scale faster because a chat bot can have an, an, a conversation with a real human um, and it can do it at scale. So a chat bot could be talking to a thousand people at the same time, where if we were to scale a conversation between you and me, we wouldn't be able to obviously do that. So there's a massive, um, distinction there the the difference is um that you you're limited to the to the input that you you give it um what you put in is what you get out so as my friend sandy carter said on stage the garbage in garbage out yeah so we're seeing a lot of chat bots right now that really aren't doing a whole heck of a lot um but i think you're going to i think you're gonna see a lot of smart people figure out smart ways to use it what are some of those smart ways you can use it to um you know, uh, engage with people that maybe they like your content and they like to have their, your content delivered to their messenger. Uh, and so you can deliver a blog once a week to their messenger. You, they can ask you endless questions in terms of what you build into it. So what's the weather like? You can tell them what the weather is in the forecast. You can uh, connect them with other people. Uh, you if I'm like, for example, a retailer take email addresses and in, in, and have it auto respond on, on, on an email channel so that it switches from messenger to email. Um, what was that? I, I was just thinking, you know, so if I'm to, to make it as concrete as possible, if I'm a, uh, if I'm a retailer, you know, I'm a Patagonia, for example, and I'm trying to, trying to sell new, uh, uh surfboard shorts for the summer and I have chat bots, uh, on my website. Uh, what might a chat bot do that would, uh, you know, engage a customer and may, maybe lead to a sale? Well, let me, let me walk you through um, uh, a, 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 a potential uh, use case. Okay, Let's great. say that you're, um, you're, I wouldn't put it past Amazon to start doing something like this soon, where you get on the messenger and you, you get on the chat bot with Amazon and you say, I'm really interested in, um, in, in, purchasing some new boots and it says, well, what color boots and what's, what kind of style, uh, you know, I need dress boots, black. Um, okay. Well, uh, what's your shoe size? Uh, I'm a nine and a half. Um, how, when do you need them? Uh, Tuesday would be great. Thank you. Um, you know, I noticed you, Can you live ask it to make me look like, uh, you know, James Dean or Steve McQueen or somebody really super cool. <laughs> Can, can you also Kelly's send me some, uh, <laughs> some new clothes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> help. Um, yeah, you know, the, and, and, and the if and this, so it's really the beginning of sort of uh, encompassing some artificial intelligence into a, a user and or in this case, a customer interaction uh, use case, uh, in this case, a sales use case where they're sort of uh, really doing the role of what a salesperson might do. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And, and it's faster, right? Yeah. Um, there's no wait time for a chat bot. So when, when you get on uh, customer support, there's nothing worse than seeing there's 20 people ahead of you yeah. um, on a, you know, on a chat or even on the phone. Um, that's not, that's not the case with this, but you know, there's also the propensity that you, you know, it's only as good as the information you give it. So there's, there's responses that it won't have. And that's when it turns into machine learning. Uh, machine learning is built into a lot of these, so it collects all the questions that it's not able to uh, ask, and it gets smarter over time. It says, well, I can't answer this now, but I'm going to go back and tell my programmer I need to know this answer for the next time. And so it starts to learn what it needs to know better. You start to feed it more information, and before you know it over a couple years, it can do almost anything. And right now, excuse me if I'm uh, being ignorant, but the, let's say there's 15 questions that show up over a couple of days that the chatbot doesn't know what to do with. Where we are with the technology today, a human being still has to answer those questions and, and then the chatbot uses those questions going forward that we're not at a place where the chatbot's like figuring out the answers to questions yet, right? Right. 
Yeah, imagine it being a giant FAQ. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not to be confused with a giant F-A-R-T. Never, <laughs> never. That's a different kind of chat bot. <laughs> Brian, are there tools that you use to create the chat bots that you like? Uh, there's not one right now that I like, that I love. There's, um, there's, a, there's about five to seven of them that are drag and drop. If you, if you can do a flow chart, you can build a chat bot. Um, and, and quite frankly, if you actually just Googled chatbots, um, they'll, sh they'll all show up on the first page, uh, chatbot software. Um, there, there's not that many out right now. And the ones that are out are, they're about 75% there. There's going to be some, um, some, so there's going to need to be some, some changes there because I think, you know, it's still not, um, it, you still, uh, the user experience is not there yet. So if you're, uh, you could, I, like I took all morning to program, to build this one chat bot, but you know, you have to go back and forth and really, uh, figure out what, what that person, how that person feels and what they're seeing and the words that are being used. So I don't really think that it's the software as much it is, as it is the person who's actually like putting all this information in and, um, and how they say it. Like I noticed someone else's chat bot that just said, hi, how are you? I'm a chat bot. I'd love to help you out versus like, uh, you know, being funny or in, inserting some kind of humor there. And that's up to us to put in. Um, so I don't think it's the software as, as, as much as it is us humans that are holding it back. And do you build them for messenger only or, or do you also build them for Slack? Yeah, it's for Slack as well. Uh, there's about nine different channels. And do you have to build them separately for each channel? Nope. The one you build one and then you connect it to whatever you need. So b okay. build, build once run anywhere kind of a thing. Right. So what's the for, tool for most of them? What's the tool you're using? Oh, I I'm using three of them. And to be honest with you, I don't remember the names. <laughs> well, that's not no, 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 clearly no category King in the chat bot space uh, yet. No, right? no, it's, um, I built three chat bots on three different pieces of software this morning. Um, he, I'll look it up while we're talking. Yeah. Thanks. So what are the other things going on in your world sort of at the forefront of social and digital marketing that you think people should be paying attention to right now? You know, um, I think, you know, I also think that, that, um, going back and actually revisiting your marketing funnel is it's a good time to do that. Um, I, I know a lot of companies, a lot of people that set it up and then forgot about it. Um, and so, you know, email marketing and, and channel marketing of any kind that you're doing, um, which, which right now I think is the most useful kind of marketing out there. Um, it's more, more, more human and more social than any other social out there. And I think, you know, it's a really good idea to go back and, and again, like, like the chat bots, a lot of pe a lot of emails that we receive are not very human Yeah. and they speak to such a wide audience that, um, it doesn't feel very personalized other than, you know, them inserting our first name into the very beginning of the email. But, um, but I, I think that there's a lot of communication out there that will start to need another look over to make sure that it's segmented correctly and, and talking to the right person about the right thing. And so when you say the kind of the marketing funnel, just so that I understand, let's say for sake of argument, a, a prospect comes to our website, we capture some information and email and, and whatever other information from that prospect, but they don't buy anything. What we're trying to do, I assume here is we're trying to in, in, interact with them digitally in a way that's personalized to them, whether it's over email or some other, you know, uh, digital communication and, and use that intelligent sort of uh, uh, way to send them personalized stuff to essentially warm them up as they go through the consideration cycle such yeah. that they have a preference to buy for us, from us. Is that sort of how, how uh, we should think about this? Yeah, that's, it's almost um, better than I could have said it. I think uh, <laughs> the, well, I've uh, been reading your shit, Brian, and it's very, very awesome shit. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, let's, let's stop the interview now then. <laughs> no, we want to hear all about uh, shareology. And I mean, you're, you're Mr. H to H, right? Human to human. And so what I, uh, I like, I, you know, I love a lot of things about you, Brian, but one of them is, 
in the social digital world for quite some time now, you've been at the forefront of making it human centered. I mean, you call it human to human and, and, you know, just even the term shareology, there's a fun, uh, playfulness about that term that you coined and of course your book. And so uh, really trying to use this technology to, uh, personalize and humanize interactions between companies and, and people. And, you know, that's a really big idea. Yeah. You know, go big or go home. <laughs> and so what's kind of it, if you think about, you know, um, uh, the key parts of those concepts, I mean, how would you unpack uh, shareology? Um, you bet. And I'll answer that. But let me, um, let me give you the three names of those chat bots since I have them. Oh, up beautiful. I'll answer your question. Um, it's chat fuel, botsify, and on SQL. Awesome. Thanks. So there you go. Um, how I would unpack it. It's shareology is the why, where, what, when, and how people and brands share. And I basically interviewed uh, well over 250 uh, people from all walks of life to figure out what makes uh, sharing, um, uh, uh, boiling it down to, to the essence of what makes sharing um, uh, unique, authentic, and, and useful for each individual and business. Um, and then I even boiled it down further to a, um, an, like a, um, a foundation of how, how people and brands could share that would be highly successful and potentially go viral. Yeah, so you, you said the magic word, right? Everybody um, in marketing today wants to create some piece of content that all of a sudden catches fire and goes viral and is seen by 25 million people in 30 seconds or less. And so, uh, and when you hear a lot of people talk about this, Brian, it's almost as if it's like, how do you catch lightning in a bottle is, is sort of what you hear people say a lot. And so as if there's sort of no best practices for creating things that get shared a lot. And, and you, you, you've really uh, said, Hey, wait a minute, that's not fucking true. Like there is a, there is a way to unpack what people who are very successful at sharing things on the uh, internet are do and, and begin to duplicate some of those best practices. So if we said, Hey, we, we want, you know, legends and losers to be shared by 20 million people in the next 15 seconds. What, what would we do? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be successful in the next 15 seconds. I can tell you. <laughs> um, sorry to, sorry to uh, take your idea down there. Um, you know, uh, the best way to put it is if, um, have, have both of you guys have been in, in the wave in a stadium where you stand up and sit down? in the middle of the wave. Yeah, yeah of course. Okay. Yeah. So, so the wave, if you think about the wave, the wave is started by one person and, um, and it goes um, into a much, uh, once that person's really kind of gets everybody going, the smaller group starts to stand up and sit down and then it grows to a bigger group and a bigger group. And before you know it, it goes around the stadium. Sometimes it goes around once, sometimes it goes around twice, sometimes five times. And every once in a while, you hit this, this thing where it just goes and goes and goes, you know, seven, ten times. And that's when, that's when things go viral, right? But what made it do that? And so if you start looking at the wave in conjunction with, um, you know, what, what might be, uh, you know, uh, what might be, con you know, conveyed as, as going viral, you're, you're, um, you can follow the same kind of pattern. So... First and foremost, uh, George, Crazy George started the wave in 1982, I think it was 82, in, or at least the early 80s, in, at the Oakland A's Coliseum. Um, he he so started, it was started right here in, uh, in the Bay Area. That's right. Wow, yeah. in 1982, you said? I think it was 82. It was in the early 80s. Awesome. And he... Um, he he and is that what he wanted to do he was trying to make the whole stadiums to yeah. sort of stay up but like he he it wasn't an accident he sort of said hey this is what i'm trying to get people to do yeah exactly he he, and he tried doing it for it took him two years to get to and he tried at every single game to get the entire stadium to do to act like idiots and stand up and sit down at the same time and nobody was buying into it what's that I think you're on mute there, handsome. <laughs> you could have had some help. Say it again. 
he should have gotten some friends to help him kick it off. Yeah, he tried, man. He tried for two years. He tried everything he knew. And, um, and, and, and he, it finally took. And when it did take, it, um, it went off in the stadium. And then a week later, it went off at another stadium. And a week later, it went off in another stadium. Before you knew it, the wave became a wave. That's my, awesome. my point of, of telling that story is not that, um, you know, the wave is cool. It's actually quite simple, right? If you think about it, because everyone just has one part. Stand up, sit down, right when it's your turn. That's all you have to do. So that's the same thing on uh, social media and going viral. It always takes one person. Um, it, look at the Bat Kid uh, several years ago. If you guys remember the Bat Kid, um, it was such Absolutely. a heartwarming story. Such a heartwarming story in San Francisco where the, the Bat Kid started to, um, you know, he made a wish. He wanted to be Batman for the day. It was his, his, his uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation wish. He, he ended up um, uh, getting written up by this one blogger who talked about his wish because there are wishes that happen all the time with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. But what made his unique was his story. Somebody wrote about it, and that blogger's uh, article um, got caught fire, and, um, and the entire city started to put together this amazing day for this kid. And he went all over the place. He did all kinds of things. There were interactive maps to follow him throughout the day in the Batmobile. And, see, and he got to throw a pitch at, at, uh, at the Giants Stadium. I mean, there were all kinds of fun things. But the Bat Kid, why it went viral was, one, because the, con the, the, the idea was simple. It was to help a little boy fulfill his wish to be Bat Kid for the day. Two, it, it, it was heartwarming. It, it touched everyone's hearts and it really made them feel like they wanted to belong. Three, it involved a community of people. They felt like they could be involved in the day by helping to usher a bat kid down the street to his next, um, his next event. And number four, it took one person to, to share that story and everyone else to sit down and stand up at the right time in order to share the story out. The same thing happened with the ice challenge, the ice bu bucket challenge. If you look at um, actually the data that goes along with that, you can see exactly where the first story was created, where the share happened, and then where all the influence was gaining momentum. Um, and I've studied influence and I've studied all the points of influence. And at the end of the day, um, you know, these things can be, um, can be systemized and you can put them in and make sure that everything that you do follows these kind of simple rules alongside making sure that um, it's, it's shareable. Because um, a lot of people put stuff out there that just isn't shareable. And, and if, you know, as a former CMO, if I, if I was an active CMO today and I said to you, hey, Brian, you know, you're the father of shareology, right? What, what, percentage of my marketing do you think I should be trying to architect in a, in a shareable uh, social viral kind of way? I don't know. Um, that's a tough one because every business is totally different from the next. And I don't think that there's a one size fits all for, for um, you know, uh, what I would tell everyone to do. Um, but I do think that um, where I, if I were a CMO for a day, I'd put most of my efforts into content. Um, and creating content that matters, um, quality, good content, not BuzzFeed content. Um, and I would, I would build a, a, a team of people that could help create that content. Um, and then I would start building influence, uh, influencers um, that are totally, either totally into our product or service or, um, or want an inside look into the product or service. And then I would start onboarding them into the into the um, organization and helping them to see what's possible. Because those are your people that are sitting down and standing up. If you don't have anyone to share with influence, then you don't have much of a, a marketing campaign. So I think there's a lot of marketers who believe they're creating great content and maybe they are and maybe they aren't, but l let's, let's assume for a second may that, that maybe they are. And they get frustrated because they put a blog out on Medium or LinkedIn or their own website or whatever it is, or they create, you know, some kind of a video or whatever the asset is. And they spend all this time trying to make it, you know, legendary and they put it out in the world and, you know, they get three views and a half a like and, and they get really fucking pissed off because they spend all this time on the content and it doesn't seem to go anywhere. And so 
are, are people missing this influencer concept or what is it that, that uh, assuming the content is valuable content, which it isn't always, but let's just assume it is for a second. Why is it then that some really valuable content doesn't go anywhere? Yeah, well, you know, it, people treat content kind of like as a, as a mass media buy. Um, and so if you look at buying ads on Google or Facebook, uh, the old model would have said that you should, um, and I'll get back to your question, but just to make a, a point here, if you look at media as a mass media buy, people are starting to look at content the same way. Like produce the most amount of content that we can and one thing might hit or, um, or something will go viral. Um, I, I think that, that the same thing. So is that, sorry to cut you off, Brian, but is that like the throw shit against the wall and just see what sticks kind of approach? Yeah. Yeah. And you're saying like in most things, that's not effective in, for, for content right. distribution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. I was just reading a report yesterday about how, um, how I forget which company it was, but they, they took, um, all of their mass media spend and actually whittled it down to just 150 sites. So from, from uh, hundreds of thousands of sites that it was broadcast over the Google network, they actually whitelisted only 150 sites that they knew they wanted their message to appear. Cause there's a huge thing going on right now where people are backing off of YouTube currently because they're broadcasting information on YouTube and it's going over stuff that doesn't, that's not brand worthy, like a bad, <laughs> a company that maybe you really don't want your, uh, your, your information to show up with. And so they, they and is this, uh, sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but you're, you're so awesome. And you keep touching on these awesome things. You know, this, this issue for YouTube is a powerful one. And, and let me make sure I understand it. So there's some very big brands uh, recently who are pulling away from advertising and pulling away from putting content on YouTube because of questionable content that their either content has been put next to or that their ads have been put next to. And if I'm, and I don't know if this is one of them, but I'll just make it up. If I'm a Coca-Cola or a Nike, I, I, I don't want to be next to like, uh, you know, dorky Dave's, you right. know, devilish donut shop or right. whatever. Yeah. I, I, right. And so, and some of the content's questionable. And so, and so, YouTube has always said, hey, we're a platform, yeah. right? We're not responsible for whatever happens on here. And now you've got big brands saying, well, you can take that position if you want, but I cannot have my brand. I've spent all this, you know, billions of dollars building next to this horrible content, or I can't have my ad next to this horrible content. That, that's what's going on. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's gotten to the point now where um, exactly what you said has forced them off of YouTube 100%. Because so where, no where are they going that can put them next to, there's no way of pointing to content and saying, I just want to be there, there and there and there. Yeah. Um, and so YouTube has a massive problem that they have to take care of if they don't want to keep losing customers. It's a little bit, it reminds me a little bit, Brian, of the, the stance Facebook originally took on fake news. They said, Hey, we're a platform. We're not responsible for this and shit happens. And as the problem got clearer and bigger and so forth and so on, because uh, they said we're not a media company, right? We're a tech company. They kind of changed position, and now they have to deal with the fake news uh, and, and back down from, "Hey, we're just a we're just a platform provider." Is that it's essentially is it the same thing? Yes. Yeah. And so, where where are the brands who don't want to be on YouTube because of this? Where are they going? Um, they're picking and choosing. So so they know what works. The, the, so this is the interesting piece. All right. I found it really interesting yesterday when I was reading this. At the end of the day, they haven't lost any traffic. Uh, they haven't had a traffic decrease. Um, they, they basically, they knew, um, that's the nice thing about analytics, is you can tell where most of your traffic comes from. So they picked the 150 that they're comfortable with. They knew exactly how much traffic they get from those 150, and they turned on advertising just directly to those 150 sites. Now they controlled where their, where their content was showing up, and they realized that it wasn't decreasing, that they actually were doing well. So now what they're going to do is they're going to just start to add one at a time and see how it does in performance rather than going out to the network. They are controlling the output, which is so much like where we came from with billboards and radio and TV. It's just that we can now analyze it digitally. Well, and, and you know, not to uh... – 
I was going to say something inappropriate, like tickle your nuts, but uh, not to do something like that. Uh, but doesn't it very much validate the whole concept of human to human and then that you again build on in shareology in that, for lack of a better term, um, we're now getting better and better at uh, microcasting or at really being able to pinpoint the kinds of people that we want to communicate with and then clearly understanding where those people are hanging out on the interwebs. Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. And so the H to H future gets realer and realer. And as our analytics get better and better, maybe I don't have to be on the giant platform uh, YouTube. I can be on some very specialized thing. Is that, that what we're seeing? Yeah. And it's killing the agency model. Wow. The, the agency model is, is going to change radically more so than it's ever changed before because they're not going to get to buy mass media. And the, the department's CMO and the, and the marketing department, if they know that they want to sharp shoot, it's better to hire a consultant or a team of people that knows what they're doing on that one thing than it is to buy, or, buy a, a company or an agency that's used to buying mass media. And, and I mean, just recently, I can keep going on about this, but P, 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 uh, Procter & Gamble just eliminated all uh, third-party purchases. So agencies can no longer outsource media anyway. Um, they have oh, to turn oh, in oh, their books I, I, and their I, I, accounting and everything and prove to everyone that they are not outsourcing this, this service. So it's going to so, change. So PG&E is not outsourcing their media purchases anymore? Uh, P&G, Procter & Gamble. Oh, P&G. Yeah, p and I'm sorry. They are not outsourcing their media buys. So right. they're their own media buyer now. They are either doing their own media buy or they're doing it directly with the um, with with a cons- with a consulting arm that's doing it. That is that's their specialty. Uh, but, and it, so you see the it, days of the go out and hire a third party to do it, or they would do it in house. But in house was mass media. What we're talking about here now. Now if we're going to start going in on laser laser shooting the hundred and fifty then that's, a, that's, not, that's, not, um, that's not what an agency is built on. They're built on mass media. That's not yeah. gonna, they're not going to be able to carry that because they're, 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 they need to make money on, on the mass media model that they've been doing. So if you think about the, the marketing and media context that we've all grown up in, most people refer to it as reach and frequency. And it was based on a model that sort of said, the more times, the more people hear about my product and or brand and or company, the better I'll be. And so uh, if, you're, if you're pampers and you're trying to get to all the you know, pregnant folks around the country, then you're going to essentially spray and pray is, is reach and frequency. And that is the paradigm that has informed marketing thinking, even if you don't realize it, it sits there. And, and now we're finally starting to say, um, we, we can't afford that and it doesn't make any sense. And now that we have the analytics and the ability to go to use your language, Brian, human to human, um, we're beginning to see, finally see now that the death of mass media. I don't know about the death, but, um, I don't know if I would go that far, but I, I would say a, a, a continued decrease, um, over time. So maybe not the death, but they're starting to get beat up in the octagon. The fight's not going their way anymore. (laughs) Yeah. And it hasn't been for a long time. Agencies have been, uh, for the the large part, uh, removed from retainers and um, put onto projects. projects. Um, Agency models are are having a real tough time because specialties are really micro-focused. And and what we need from our marketers now are so specific that yeah. it's hard to keep that kind of talent on board. And so, uh, you know, Brian, you have an incredible vision into the future because you're re- li- literally you live and work on the on the very edge of what's going on in marketing and technology. Maybe paint a picture for Colin and I. What is the marketing organization of the you know f- of five years from now? Uh, look like, uh, particularly, you know, if you could underscore the, the things that you think are pretty different from how it looks today. Well, so the marketer today is becoming, um, a, 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 what do they call it, a, market, a marketer CTO or some combination yeah. of that. It's, it's kind of a technology marketer's role. Of course, it depends on the industry that you're in, but it, it's, I think eventually your, your, your CTO and your CMO roles will um, will come closer together more than ever. 
wow. uh, to the point where that you may even hire one person that can manage both. Because if we're all in the cloud, if everybody's in the cloud and we don't host servers and we don't host email and we don't host anything, yeah, then then the then the technology becomes more about how we market and less about how we function. Yeah, we don't we don't need um, a thousand people in the boiler room taking care of the carbon ingulators. Right. Because Amazon's doing that for us or whoever. Yeah. yeah. So, so now so in that sense, in that sense, we don't need a traditional CTO or CIO that has a technical background. We need more of a business executive who understands how to uh, deploy technology to create business advantage. Right. Now, I'm talking far out. I'm, you're, I'm, I'm is, that, is that five years or is that 10 years? Or I think it's between five and 10. Um, okay, well, fuck, seven. five years goes by, you know, the older you get, Brian, five years goes by in about 15 seconds. <laughs> hey, man, you're messing with my chi. <laughs> oh, I don't, I mean, please realign your chakras, namaste. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think that it is going to go fast. Um, in, 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 in Silicon Valley years, it'll go fast. And um, in, in um, where we're at, though, it's going to start to change the way that we view uh, hiring people outside of organizations is the point. Um, you know, how we, what, what does an agency model look like will change, as I was saying, and what we hire in terms of specialties or people that are super micro focused on um, how to analyze your analytics inside of, um, you know, a chat bot and know, you know, where your, your sales are happening and, and where to, where, to, where to focus and then how to change the language. I mean, that's going to be a job someday. Yeah. So, and so, uh, you know, for example, my nephew, Lucas, is about, I don't know, in my mind, he's 12, but I think he's around 25-ish. And he just graduated with a, uh, um, a master's in essentially data science. And, um, and so is what you're saying, marketers are going to be hiring a lot of Lucases. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, look at the top 20 jobs on LinkedIn that they just, just released this year. Um, it's, it's very technical, you know, it's a very technical t uh, list of people. Is it, um, is it akin, Brian, you know, if you go back, maybe, I don't know if it would be quite 10 years, maybe, but uh, on wall street where the wall street guys went, Holy shit. If we hired a bunch of fucking guys who would normally go to work at NASA and fucking put them to work on using their, super awesome math skills coupled with fucking Watson type computing power, they might actually figure out some fuck algorithm that makes us zillions of dollars, right? They had that insight on Wall Street, I don't know, plus or minus a decade ago. And we know what the result has been. I mean, some good and some bad, obviously. Uh, is that this sort of aha that's happening for marketers? Is, is if I hire a team of Lucases and these guys fucking money ball the shit out of my market category that I might discover some shit that no one else knows and create an atomic bomb to drop on my competition? And will the computer ask you if you want to play a game? Um, <laughs> I, I don't... Uh, Hit him again! Ooh, ooh. I don't know if... Um, your, your, um, your, your synopsis there is pretty, uh, pre pretty far out from a distance standpoint of being like maybe even 10 to 15 years. Um, I do believe in humanity at the end of the day. I don't believe that robots are going to take over. Um, I don't believe that, I, I believe that, that humans are actually going to have a bigger challenge if you want to go even more out there with um, how many chips and things that we embed in ourselves uh, first before we are nervous or scared about actual robots uh, taking over. So I think we, the neural we chips, should, we, we need put, to think. I mean, just, uh, Elon Musk just started a neural chip download upload uh, company last week to help us download and upload information into our brains. That's gonna, that to me is a little bit more creepy and exciting, excitingly creepy than the robots taking over. That's unbelievable. That's an incredible idea. You know, like, I don't know about you, but I, I, I am very spotty with Bluetooth. So if that shit is as reliable as Bluetooth and it's connected to our brain, like some weird shit could be happening. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying the phone companies suck at building phones. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, again, human error. Um, my dad has a pacemaker and that thing connects to the internet and there's never downtime. 
Um, it's, it's all Bluetooth as well. It's Bluetooth right through. And that wow. Thing and so he's got a Bluetooth seen it before. So our phones actually aren't as good a quality as they should be um, because, because of the way that they design the chips and the size of the phone. But if they did it right, they have the technology to make it better. I, I just want to unpack that one a little bit, Brian, because it's, it's just too fun. So your dad has a Bluetooth enabled IOT because uh, I assume the data comes off the Bluetooth and goes to his phone, right? I'm guessing. Yeah. Is there an app on his phone that tells him how he's doing? There's an app and then there's a home base inside of his house. It uploads to the home base every night at 1 a.m. And does that go to his doctor's office or, you know, every, yeah. <laughs> yep. They, they have access to the ups and downs. They're able to spot what's happening, what's not happening uh, and tell him and predict uh, two weeks in advance if something is going to occur and, and be able to take care of it ahead of time. And what's your dad's first name, Brian? His name is Rich. Rich. So Rich has literally got a bionic heart. He right? Me- remember the $6 million dollar man back in the 70s, Steve Austin? He's got a Steve Austin heart. Yeah. And he didn't even have internet. And have you, have you seen, um, you know, the, the arms that they can create now that are uh, attachments? Um, there are arms that actually work, so they attach it to um, and, and look exactly like a hand. They have, uh, they have made a skin-like substance. I don't know exactly what it is, but enough that you feel like and look like a hand. So it's like Luke Skywalker-ish, and it actually has joints and it moves. And then you can, it, which I think, again, this goes into the creepy zone, you can, you can detach it. Let's say you have a, it goes from your elbow to your whole hand, right? You can detach just the hand and then put another attachment on it that let's say is a bow uh, holder, like for bows and arrows or a gun. Um, I, I'll, we'll choose bows just because it's less uh, intrusive. And, and this lady tried it, tried it on. She'd never shot a bow before. And then she sat there and she shot the bow and it hit the target the very first time. And that's because her arm is dialed into exactly what it needs to do and where it needs to go. Um, her, uh, her, her stance and everything was, was off, but her arm knew exactly what it needed to do to get, get in position. And she shot target after target after target. So, um, I mean, why, why no, not it, trade in your, your arm for one of those, right? No, it's incredible. Uh, I have a buddy named Jeff Denholm, and he's a uh, world-class uh, adventure action sports athlete. He's also a great entrepreneur. And he's a Patagonia ambassador. And uh, when he was a young man, his right arm got torn off. He was a, he's a merchant marine and he got it caught up in some rope. And it was a horrifying accident that mm-hmm. almost killed him. Anyway, uh, this guy does those races in Hawaii where they paddle from one island to the other. This guy will go ski the nastiest, gnarliest stuff you could ever possibly imagine. He surfs Mavericks. He surfs, you know, you name a big wave in the world, he's probably surfed it. I mean, he is an extraordinary athlete. And the thing that's unbelievable, uh, and I, you know, it, it's a giant bummer. Uh, and he's told me, and I mean, there's no doubt not having an arm sucks, really sucks. But the prosthetics and all that stuff, it's its amazing um, what you're still able to do. Um, with the right tool and, and the technology to build that stuff. Yeah, it, um, it is amazing. And that kind of stuff being connected to our, um, you know, to, to our sensors and to everything is going to be, going to be pretty cool to the point where so, I so might you, trade in my, my, my hand, <laughs> you know, when you say I'd give my left arm for something, you just might do it. You might. So, so IOT connected prosthetic devices, uh, you, you think we're going to get to a place where they might be more desirable than the, the human body we have. Absolutely. <laughs> I, and, and, uh, and then we can flip that around. It'd we be like say, buying, uh, it'd be like buying, you know, like a Jeep. You know, people love to buy Jeeps cause they're so customizable and, and, right? you know, a lot of the uh, muscle cars and you can change the tires and lift it and put all this shit on it. So is it like the, is, is that where we're going? We can accessorize our human bodies the way we want going forward. Yeah. I think so. I, I think that's, that's a good 15 to 20 years out, but absolutely. Um, and, but I also think that it, it's going to work on the flip side where, um, where we're going to be able to solve, um, like right now there's a company in Switzerland that, uh, it, that's all virtual reality for healthcare. You can wear the goggles and inside the, 
environment, it's you in a chair, in a wheelchair. And if you ha ha aren't able to move, if you're paraplegic, you're not able to move your arms or your legs, it actually shows you inside um, a 3D version of yourself and it, and, it, and it shows you actually lifting an arm or lifting a leg. And it feels to you like that's actually happening. What they realized um, in real life while that's happening is that they're seeing movement from the actual arm and it's actually moving up a little bit. So by actually tricking the brain into thinking about what it can actually do, it's working. Well, I, um, I've become obsessed with neurology. I have a neurological condition. And so, you know, the way you go, right? And one of the things I remember reading, and I, I'm trying to remember what book I read it in, but it, it was such a simple insight, but so powerful that underscores the exact point, Brian, you're on, which is uh, you and I as human beings can't delineate between an experience we actually had and an experience we imagine or see. And the simplest example is we've all been to a movie and seen something incredibly awesome happen and feel uplifted or seen something incredibly horrible or sad happen and have our eye tear up. And we know nothing happened. We're watching a movie and yet it's changing our emotions. And so uh, I guess this insight that uh, if your mind thinks it happened to your body, it begins to fire your neurology in that direction. That's the insight as I remember it. I mean, what do I know? I got thrown out of high school, but that, is that, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. That's, that's it. I mean, mind over matter. Um, everything is, everything is uh, uh, stronger when you can realize it. And using virtual reality and augmented reality this next year, when um, Apple brings out its augmented reality uh, glasses and, and phone, it's going to start to shift the way that we, we operate. So, so Apple comes out with uh, AR this year? Yep, in 2018. A year, one year from now, they'll, they'll okay. come out with an so AR. A year from, a year from now, 2018. Yeah, they'll come out with an augmented reality device. It will most likely be your phone. It may pair up with some glasses. Um, I doubt it'll be Google-like. They learned a lesson on that. Uh, uh, but you're going to be able to probably do things. And now this is me pontificating because um, I, I don't have insight into this. I do know that Apple's coming out with something. But, um, but I, would, I, I would imagine that uh, facial recognition will be possible, um, that we'll be able to see somebody walking at us and know their name uh, and their birthday and their favorite color and, um, you know, that, that, how, that their mom is sick or, you know, and it's all going to be accessible through social media, which is going to be accessible right then and there when you see them. And, um, and we're going to be able to integrate wow. uh, things that we take for granted or aren't able to take or aren't able to do, and it's going to present us with the information that we need. You know, Brian, you're, I think you're blowing our minds. That's, um, that's an incredible insight. And uh, is there anything else like that you want to share with us as we kind of wind down here, Brian? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we've, uh, we've covered every possible creepy moment we can. Well, no, it's fantastic. I mean, you told us about marketing technology today and where that's going and the, what the marketing organization of the future looks like. And now you've given us some real insight into uh, you know, machine learning, AI, and now AR and DOG and FART and IUD. And so it's really been a great conversation. <laughs> Just, just remember if you, if, I mean, if this, all of this, whoever's watching or listening, this isn't meant to creep people out or make, make them scared because nothing happens overnight. Um, we work our way up to things. In 1984, um, Faith Popcorn wrote the Popcorn Report, and she predicted yeah. that we would have, I think we talked about this last time, she predicted that, um, that uh, we would have shopping uh, available to us in our home that we would never have to go to a grocery store, that we would work and telecommute. That's and right. Um, we yeah. would go to work, that we would have um, availability to all these different things that we never could even fathom. And, and here we are today uh, with all those things. So you know, we, though that is going to happen. What, what we, what we uh, need to remember is that none of that ha happened overnight. We, we were warmed up to each and every single one of those to the point where it became acceptable. And, and, um, and so all of these things sound, sound creepy in the future, but they will warm up to be acceptable over time and we will be okay with them. Or most of us, <laughs> not all of us. Yeah, because we warm up to it over time. 
Well, uh, Brian Kramer, you are one fucking smart, fun, insightful, and uh, fascinating, and dare we say, Colin, legendary guy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, and uh, uh, we, we hope you grace us with your presence again, uh, not too far out into the future, Brian. Yeah, man, especially since you're over in Santa Cruz. We got to make that happen. Yeah, hey, maybe you could come over here. You know, we're just a couple of blocks from the beach. You could uh, visit ah. the Legends and Losers Worldwide Studio, and uh, uh, Carrie could maybe make us a wonderful meal. And, you know, maybe we could do it when Susan's around. That would be really cool. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, Brian. You're a legendary guy. We really appreciate it. Bye, Brian. Cheers, guys. All right. Aren't we lucky to have had that conversation with Brian? Uh, we would like to uh, shout out here to our friend Patrick Grady. Thank you so much, so much, Patrick, for your legendary review of Play Bigger on Amazon and Facebook. Uh, our friend Casey McCoy uh, for the legendary Legends and Losers iTunes review. And we would like to remind you to check out the One Life Roadmap on onelifefullylived.org. With that, we'd like to thank HarperCollins, Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets, Equity Directory, the invite-only network of entrepreneurs and startup talent exchanging work for equity, OneLifeFullyLived.org, Dream It, Plan It, and Live It. Doctors Without Borders, we are saving lives in the worst parts of the world. Send us some money. Chi Power Arts in Santa Cruz, California. Interview Valet, get your ass on some podcasts and grow rich. Go Abundance, the tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous men who choose to lead epic lives. Our friends at Brandon Smith Audio in Santa Cruz, California. Shareology, the legendary must read from today's guest, Brian Kramer. And Conscious Millionaire, the podcast from our friend J.V. Crumb III. Now, we have to tell you that today's information was provided to you solely for informational purposes. Warning, all episodes contain nuts. This oddcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. Listen to Leonard Cohen. Do not break your arm patting yourself on the back. George Carlin was right. Don't be a pain. Get out of the passing lane. This podcast really ties the room together. And uh, oh, our apologies to Nick Halstad, CEO of Cognitive Logic. Sorry, Nikki, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thanks for tuning in and be legendary, our friends.